Hello everyone and welcome back for the final lecture in COS, our course on commercial open source uh, startups. This really is the last lecture, the fourth one and the third part or the twelfth in the total lecture series on how to create a software startup and not just any software startup but one based on commercial open source business models. So in this last third part we talked about how to spin off from a university where you might have been successfully performing research and making your software available as open source uh, all the way now to having incorporated and facing for the first time commercial or private investors. Basically how to fund your startup after you incorporate it. That is the last and final step I'm going with you in this course and naturally there will be other courses to pick you up uh, as a going concern uh, after these initial steps. So then, uh, startup funding. To understand startup funding, you need to have an understanding of the timeline or the likely future development of a startup. Now, the only thing we know is that we can't predict the future. So the startup timeline has to mean knowledge of patterns of how it could be like. So a default pattern and then most likely you're not going to be like that pattern. But it's useful to understand the basic story to see where you are, how you relate and what people are expecting or thinking about you. So here you can see the Silicon Valley startup uh, timeline and um, it consists of the main part where you are a private and independent company of a startup uh, from your initial founding through maturity until some so-called liquidity event, either a company sale uh, to some other company, you're, you're being acquired or you merge or even the coveted uh, IPO initial public offering of your company in a stock market or at a stock exchange. Before founding, there's university. That's what we covered in this course in the last few lectures. Then there's the startup and then there's a post exit life of the startup, which will be very different from the startup life because either now you're part of a different larger company or you are a public company both of which has its very own rules that we are not covering here. So for the time frame of being a private and independent company, uh, you hope to grow. That growth has multiple aspects to it. There is the domain specific aspect, as we discussed it in the startup lectures, where you gain increasing fit of your product and products with markets and customers. So the three main phases you may remember are problem solution fit, that's the earliest phase, then product market fit, product channel fit. You may have to iterate over it, but in the ideal case, you incrementally take these three steps one after another of increasing maturity, increasing fit, increasing efficiency of selling your product to customers and the markets in which these customers exist. Along the way, you need to fund the company, pay the salaries of people. And uh, the basic idea that you might have to pay salaries out of income may or may not work. As discussed, also discussed previously, uh, you can try to manage towards profitability, meaning you try to get to break even as soon as possible so that you can pay people from revenues and then grow incrementally but profitably, then you won't need any outside investment because you have enough money from your revenues. Or you can grow for growth's sake because there's a big market and you don't want to be overtaken in terms of market share by competitors, in case of which even though you are making money, even though you could be profitable if you would only grow slower, would not be hiring so fast, even though that may be the case, you take on 
more outside investment uh, to fuel your growth. The idea is that your growth is so tremendous that um, the additional gains you can make in market share will pay off eventually, which is a tricky business because to get outside investment, you need to give up parts of your company. So you lose your percentage share of the overall pie. And this only makes sense if the total pie grows accordingly. So the pie needs to be getting so much larger that you're willing to give up some percentages of your stake in it so that the total uh, absolute amount is still larger even with a reduced percentage. And this giving up of equity, uh, selling parts of the company to receive an investment, typically takes place in stages. Uh, so-called series, so that's the initial seed round, but then there's a series A, series B, and so forth. And while in practice you are talking to investors all the time and presenting yourself and trying to find the opportune time to raise funds, you can think about at least that's a traditional way of raising funds every 12 to 18 months. Sometimes it takes, takes a bit longer, uh, sometimes you want it to take a bit longer. It's aligned with how fast you're growing, how much revenues you're generating, and what you think the market size still is and the market share still is that you want to gain. So you take in outside investment in stages um, in the series. The initial investors, the seed investors, may be so-called business angels. Soon they will be uh, venture capitalists. Basically same thing, different operating model. They give you money for equity. At the end, as you might be an established company, even if you're still private and independent, there might even be private equity firms investing in you. Business angels, venture capitalists and private equity firms all invest money. They have different operating models, different motivations, usually laid out by maturity. So business angels take the biggest risk, but also the biggest cut for the whatever money they invest. Venture capitalists a bit less and private equity funds are the ones with substantial amounts of money for comparatively small parts of the company, unless they were all of you, um, but uh, at a very high valuation and comparatively low risk. So risk goes down over time with the investment and investments amount go up. The total time frame here used to be that you could flip companies, not so likely any longer. And you might be looking at a ride of at least five years, eight years, 10 years, uh, being all more and more common. Now to, as a startup, be fundraising, you need to understand your needs. Uh, I will not talk about the later stages again. This would be other courses. I'm focusing on uh, the initial needs, how you might approach business angels, how you might make a case for how much funds you need. And in those very early stages, in the seed stage or even at re in the research stage before you even have incorporated, where the professor is the person who has to find the funding, it's usually the salaries. So you take a look at the gross salary of people and the ancillary cost of having people. So times, so the gross salary times 1.3, 1.5 over the time frame that you want to fund them. And then how many people of what quality. So that's how you have head count of two people in research, three in validation, four during incorporation and more as a going concern. And that's how you can calculate it. As soon as the company is independent and maybe already in the last stages at the university, where you are the entrepreneurs, it's your responsibility to acquire the funds, whether it's public grants or after incorporation, private investor money. So let's look exactly at that. What types of funds are there? How can you fund your startup? Well, we have four types, four main types of uh, funding. 
there's the gift yes those exist because well, public grants are basically gifts you could take on debt if you only could because usually a startup with no assets has no collateral meaning acquiring a debt is really hard but sometimes there are people who simply trust you so-called friends families and family friends and fools the three f's uh, but that doesn't go far unless you're very rich parents who don't care and many startup entrepreneurs also simply hate dragging in the family into possibly risky investments then there are the actual investments private investors that's the business angels venture capitalists and later private equity firms they would be providing you with commercial uh, with private money and that is what you'll have to look at for growth because that's usually where public grants are not available any longer you could spawn you could you could survive on projects that you do for public uh, agencies for example but this type of po project based funding of a startup is generally not a good idea unless it is that type of lifestyle startup where you want to maintain 100% of equity by using to pay salaries through projects that you acquire you usually forego any significant growth but rather grow slowly but profitably maybe that's you that's just completely fine but then it's not the silicon valley startup that uh, many have in mind so um, here again for the public funders are the different phases that you need to be aware of which you're in and then matching grants i discussed this in the last lecture even after incorporation as a startup in the early phases and seed stage there are some uh, public funds available for you like exist two which follows exist portions transfer which are 100 percent gifts but pretty soon any public grants to the startup become less attractive than they were at the university because again they're more restricted and you rarely get 100% of your costs rather you get 50% of the costs and have to bring in the rest of it which could be from business angels so it's actually nice that public grants stretch potential business angel money so what is a business angel oh, well that's obviously a very euphemistic term these are uh, professional investors uh, angels are not so angelic uh, they are interested in making a return on their investment it's their own money they often in in invest sometimes they uh, actually also raise funds and fund and invest other people's money often they invest in cohorts so one business angel comes with two other business angels and as three people they put in money this combination of having a cohort often happens if the skills of these business angels are complementary so um, could be a former engineering manager a former salesperson and a domain expert on financial services or so for example and together they feel like they have the know-how to properly assess the investment opportunity you and whether it's worth their investment Business angels will typically tell you that they're not only bringing money, but also their network and their expertise. And that may or may not be true or a good idea. Um, if they understand how to help, they will selectively help and that might be good. Um, sometimes the network is, is, lot, is worth a lot if you can get the right introductions for sales, for example. But if it turns into meddling and them knowing better how to run your company, you might soon be in, a, in dire straits and uh, life might not be nearly as enjoyable. So business angels uh, are looking at you and are assessing you. Are you a good investment? And you need to look at them. Will you get along with them? Because by way of the investment contracts, they will get a say in your company and you may or may not like the way they act then. One step up from business angels, which are very much, uh, it was very much a personal business, um, 
are venture capital firms. So they are more uh, professional in the sense that they are real firms, even though most business angels obviously have incorporated. But uh, a venture capital firm usually has multiple people who are making investment decisions, not just one business angel. So a venture capital firm is definitely a company which acquires other people's money to invest it in startups in this case. So they have a venture capital firm has so-called limited partners. Those are the people with the money that they invest and they promise a high return on investment higher than the stock markets or certainly loans to the limited partners. Venture capital firms like business angels sometimes are general purpose, certainly the large firms, but even then uh, they actually never really general purpose. They are usually specialized. The speciality may be large, like uh, only enterprise software, not consumer software, but even within that there can be specialization like only financial services, only machine learning based stuff and so forth. What they promise, what venture capitalists to promise is really mostly to bring money. Of course, they will also promise that they will be helping the company, opening the network. Sometimes they say they have additional services because, well, any uh, startup has a gazillion of things to do and it may be stressful to have all the capabilities of doing it properly in-house, while not all of it is necessarily competitively necessary or advantageous. And so some of the VCs offer you some help with that. They want to see you succeed so that their investment has some return. When I say venture capitalists here, ultimately what I mean are the so-called general partners at the venture capital firm. Uh, these are the people by name of the role where you know that they are making the actual investment decision. Before you get to talk to a general partner, and yet, unless you have direct access, is usually uh, all kinds of investment managers and associates and so forth who you may have to talk with. So be very mindful of who you're talking to when you're talking to a venture capital firm, what decision power they have and how you, how you work with them to eventually get to or in front of a general partner uh, who can actually make an investment decision and sign that check. So this combines, uh, you can do both. And as I said, business angel like it, that uh, their comparatively little funds, small funds can get stretched by public funding. Venture capitalists already are sitting usually on too much money and are not that much interested in seeing public funding stretch your runway. But here you can see it again. So there are all these uh, public grants that can go to the university after founding because there's no a company. There are all kinds of grants also that can go public grants that can go to the startup. And of course, after founding, because there's a company to invest in, business angels and venture capitalists play a role. The size of the checks that venture capitalists starting with Series A or so can write are much larger than anything that public funding uh, really can can afford these days. So we talked about the investors, business angels, venture capitalists and private equity firms. Now these are not the only players. You need to understand that depending on context, lots of people may be involved. So not to underestimate are the lawyers. Um, the lawyers are those who draw up the contract work that you need for an investment. So they are often bridging between both worlds, the venture capital firms and the startups. And uh, it's lucrative business for them to be writing those contracts. So uh, they are always eager to find good startups and uh, also deliver them to VCs or help them with it. They may even be willing to work for you for free or defer, defer their honorary, their fees until an investment takes place and at their risk, if no investment takes place, not be paid. So that's possible. It's even possible in Germany these days. You have professional organizations that facilitate networking, networking events and so forth. And of course, your humble professor and the universities 
also play for matchmaking in all directions for founders for funders uh, for strategic partners for customers and so forth so you may wonder now uh, how such an investment by an investor uh, looks like the first question perhaps is how much are we worth how much is the company worth so that you can calculate if an investor wants to invest a million euro um, how much percentage of the company gives that to them or usually what you do is you calculate how much money you need over the next 18 months or 24 months and with that knowing how much money you need and guesstimating your actual value you know how much you have to give up or in terms of equity if you feel you're giving up too much equity you may try to negotiate upwards your actual valuation but of course that also has downsides so how actually do you uh, calculate the value of a startup after all there may not be much yet right think back to how the university looked at the startup um, because that is the earliest stages when we talked about how to take the intellectual property from the university into the startup how did we calculate that well one way was the cost of replacement method that's what you do if you really have nothing better to go on because it's really just the labor costs of what was needed to create the assets of the company it completely ignores the knowledge build up in people the actual skills and capabilities of the people, their ability to evolve that code base, the asset, further at what speed. So most likely it's going to be underestimating uh, what the actual value is. So there's a lot of promise in the team, which of course you have to sell, but of course which you also have to turn into something real. Once you get going as a concern, as a going concern, as a startup, and maybe you have first customers, you can uh, then use the revenues multiple method. That method applies maybe uh, series A, series B on forward, during C, whatever revenue you may have, if any, is not really a good predictor. So what companies do, what, what investors do here is to look at your uh, year over year growth uh, how far are you grow how much are you growing in a given year and then what revenues did you have in that year and that leads you this is purely experiment experiential values to a multiple of revenues so if you have a million euro in revenue and you just doubled that uh, revenue over the last year then you are uh, in the high between high growth and super high growth here 100 percent growth and then you have a multiple of 10 so if you had a million euro revenue the value of your company would be 10 million so you can argue we are worth 10 million now please uh, if you give us 1 million uh, that would be nine percent of the company also so um, looking at this here you can see that you have two factors that go into the valuation, the revenues and the change in revenues over the last year. And again, this is purely experience based and a very rough, rough indicator then. So there's some negotiation possible, um, but as the startup, never forget the venture capitalists have much more experience uh, than you so they are probably much better at negotiating it much later for example when you're facing uh, private equity firms you can be much more precise about the value of the company based on the actual revenues um, uh, so you could use the net price you could use the discounted cash flow method you have multiple years now of experience of how much the company is worth uh, of, of revenues and data and you can turn that into a value a valuation of the company by calculating the net present value of all future cash flows 
and um, uh, here's the, the formula you basically map out by current growth the future cash flows revenues year over year discount them using a discount factor to today and add it up and that would be the net present value of the of the company So after you've determined, there's a lot of wrangling perhaps, but after you have determined or while you're determining uh, the value, the valuation of the company, you're also discussing the actual investment. And while you may think it's solely about the valuation because everything should follow from that, that is actually not at all the case. So let's take a look at the structure or the mechanics of a funding round of an investment into your company. So if you have a valuation or a value, there actually is something basic set, which is how much money gives an investor what equity. Um, here in the example, you calculated that, the, or you agreed on a valuation of the company to be four million. The whole company before the investment is worth four million, and now uh, you decided you need one more one million until the next milestone, until the next investment. So you are asking to receive one million euro from an investor. The so-called pre-money valuation before the investment is made was four million, with the additional cash in the bank after the investment. Uh, it's the post-money valuation of the company now five million. And so that 1 million by the investor is one in one part of five or 20% of the company. So with your company being worth 4 million and the investor investing 1 million, it should give them an equity stake into the company of 20%. This math is actually hard and fixed. Uh, a lot more is negotiable. These negotiations take place uh, over what's called a term sheet. So the actual investment, the contract you sign, is a lengthy document, too long to repeatedly read and not a good base for negotiation. So in practice what happens is that you try to have a very short term sheet with the key parameters of the investment and after you have agreement on those, the lawyers will turn these parameters into the actual uh, investment contract that you then sign. And this is only possible if what's in the term sheet, the terms, have defined meaning. And then you can reduce it to this basic, um, basic one-pager or two-pager with the core information. And you can see an example here. I think that's the Y Combinator, a simple term sheet for a Series A investment. And it gives us some insight on the variability, on all the things that can be negotiated in an investment. It's not just the amount of money and the valuation. It is much more. So first of all, we see that the investors here are going for preferred stock while the founders, you, the startup, usually holds common stock. The difference is your shares are the normal ones. Preferred stock has a preference or is preferred when it comes to liquidation. So preferred, preferred stock has some advantages in the situation of not so desirable outcomes like the company has to be shut down and what to do with the remaining assets. Well, the preferred stock gets paid out first and the common stock may not get anything. So um, it's not a fair sharing. If it all goes downhill, uh, the investors get their money back first to the extent that they can still get it back. Then you can see here there are, there's a lead investor typically, like with business angels, VCs also often invest in cohorts. So, But then one of the investors is the lead investor who negotiated the terms and others tagged along. Often these days, now the investors don't take equity right away, but what you're going to sign off is 
a convertible note. It's an option for the investors to turn the investment or the convertible note, which is initially considered debt, into stock at a later time. Why? Why this weird contortion? Well, if you to take out the risk in the negotiations on the valuation. Basically, you take a convertible note or you agree on a convertible note because you can't agree yet or think it's just too uncertain to put a valuation on your company. So you're saying we need that much money, that much we know. We don't know what percentage of equity it really should be. So we are postponing the valuation until later. Not necessarily much later, but until later. And at that later point of time, that amount of money that the investors put in based on the valuation will be converted into percentage preferred uh, stock in the company. This way, the valuation um, will, be, uh, um, will be deferred and makes it maybe a little bit fairer or a bit more likely to actually be closer to a realistic value. Um, there is potentially a stock option pool for employees that needs to be mentioned because that also dilutes investors. There's the liquidation preference. So what happens in the case of a sale? So um, if the company gets sold uh, to someone else, there may well be terms in your term sheet, like the liquidation preference, where uh, the investors get double or triple the amount of money out of the deal uh, because based on their preferred stock rather than you the common stockholder who only gets a factor of one. So here in this example it's uh, one time so they get the same the factor is one like for common stock. Uh, dividends not sure why, why a startup would pay dividends. Conversion to common stock so that typically happens so the preferred stock that the investor acquires or wants to receive after note conversion uh, turns into common stock in the case of the IPO. That is what everyone's hoping for, as likely or unlikely as it may be. So um, you run into an IPO, then the uh, preferred stock loses the preference and becomes just common stock, and like any stock can then be sold uh, on the stock market. Then there are all the board shenanigans. So um, as the investors want to, unlike a university, usually wants to have a say in how the company is doing, want to be able to remove you if they think you're not performing or someone else would do better or more for the company, they will angle and debate and see how to vote on such company decisions as directors uh, as for to, to um, remove potentially the CEO or key personnel. And so these are the voting rights and the uh, shareholder meetings, board of directors with oversight for the company. Um, there may be drag along clauses who can force who to agree on things like a sale of the company. And there may be even also tag along rights, meaning uh, you have a right to invest and maintain your share of equity in later rounds um, and so forth. And so I think this is it for this example term sheet. Um, again, if you're actually facing a situation like this, I'm not entirely sure what to advise because the venture capitalists on the other side will certainly know more about it than you. So perhaps get good advice and be, very, and be cautious and ask what it is they want you to sign. There's one more thing at the bottom here, which is which I don't discuss in class, but the team itself among each other, you want to make sure that everyone's committed. So as you might split the initial founders equity among the initial founders of the company, what if one of the person, one of the people leaves quickly after founding? You're expecting them to keep working with you. And if they go, you are unhappy. So you also need terms and here the venture capitalists enforce it to keep key employees 
around, um, the founders around as uh, employees. And so um, uh, you prevent key people from leaving by, for example, saying you have to return equity if you leave too early. All of this information over time gets collected in the capitalization or cap table, uh, of which you see an example here. This was taken from a German website, the standardsinstitute.de, which also tries to give startups simple, simplified uh, templates for all the different things you do. You can see here how the cap table lists all the investors who own stock in the company. Usually you would see it over multiple rounds, uh, the math, who acquired what, and so forth. And so you see the initial founders' uh, shares, then you see the investors who are putting in money and who get shares for it. Um, there may be stock options given to, to um, key employees who are not founders and are not shareholders, and so forth. So understanding the cap table is important because that's where you track who owns the company, who has what say, and can be quite laborious. Or so it used to be very laborious in the past. These days you have companies which give you this spreadsheet as a standardized tool. And so at any point of time, you're up to date on who owns what. Um, so that is actually quite helpful to have such tools at your hand to manage your company structure and so forth. So finally, I want to talk about risk profiles. Let's assume that uh, you decide that the way of the Silicon Valley startup is what you want to do. And so you are, you chose a product which has a large market, market potential. You know you need a lot of funding over time to not be outgunned by competitors elsewhere. So you're preparing for multiple series ultimately of outside investment that you may have to take on but in return for that you are growing a really large pie where even your shrinking percentage of it is worth a lot now with that you need to understand that in terms of company ownership you're on board now with business angels and venture capitalists professionals on this who have a very different risk profile than you and I want to talk about risk profiles because this leads to conflicts of interest and potential problems in the company. What is that? So again, you have two parties. You have the founders who are putting in their lifetime in terms of employees. Uh, and it's the one thing they have. They are shareholders and it's the one job they work in. The investors, on the other hand, are past that, usually they are older, and they are invested in many different companies. Uh, the business model, at least in the past, for them was that based on, exper ex on the experience, many star on the experience, many startups would go bust, but one or two would really be the so-called home run, which returns all the lost money from the other's investment and then some more. So venture capitalists would look at investments and ask, can this go really, really big? So that it is the one investment out of 10 or so that makes, all the, makes up for all the other losses. And as a consequence, they have a risk profile where they are always gunning for the biggest possible outcome. Venture capitalists are likely, at least in the old model, uh, going to tell you, take another round, grow some more, don't sell yet. Sell meaning don't sell the company. And naturally they will have the voting rights and the boards to prevent any such sale. Now that can lead to a significant stress with founders if say there's some larger company offering to acquire you. Because founders have all their eggs in this one basket and they may be happy much more early than venture capitalists because um, they are set for life. If you make uh, 
if it's a fabulous startup you make uh, 10 million you don't care whether it's uh, 10 or 20 million so much if you are at zero before that you're much more likely to think that gunning for the larger amount uh, at significantly higher risk of not getting anything is not what you want you want to be set for life and then you can do another startup perhaps venture capitalists don't see that they will keep they will egg you on or simply decide that you need to keep going on by way of the voting power in the board so the biggest conflict of interest is that investors have a much higher appetite for risk at least traditionally than certainly first time founders it's the rare founder who wants to go all the way uh, most at some point of time will simply want to save their gains be set in life and then decide to do some more rounds if they are up for it and that is a conflict of interest with the venture capitalists now i'm being told or i hear how it is changing in that this black or white all or nothing strategy of venture capitalists is getting a bit more gray and they understand that they can manage better and more effectively even in the middle outcomes but still, I think the risk profile is such that founders are much less risk interested, are more risk averse than investors. And that's something to watch out for. If with your first, with your first term sheet, you signed over all the decision rights already to your VCs, um, you're out of luck, obviously. So that is one of the things to observe as you negotiate investments. And that's it. So we talked about the funding timeline of, uh, of a startup, how you go through series of fundings now from for growth funding, exclusively private investors, no public funds any longer, how to there how such a funding round looks like and so forth. Um, that's it for me for this course. So thank you very much for your time and attention. And of course, good luck with your venture. All the best to you.